Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. Before we get started, I would like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. When you join today's webinar, you selected to join either by phone call or computer audio. If for any reason you'd like to change your selection, you can do so by accessing your audio pane in your control panel. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenter by typing your questions in the questions pane of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time. We will collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. I would now like to turn the webinar over to today's moderator, Bill Black. Well, welcome to Fridays with Vistage. I'm Bill Black, a fellow Vistage member and your moderator today. You're in for a real treat today. The title of our webinar is Energy as the New Currency, Building Resilience by Maximizing Your Energy. Before we get started, I want to mention that today's speaker is shared with Vistage through our partnership with the nonprofit Health Network Foundation. Your VIP access to outstanding medical care at the best hospitals in America is provided by the team at Health Network. They should be your first call when your health demands networking with the best. Now, before we get started again, there's a, a handout that you should have printed out. Uh, this is called the Energy Wheel. It's available in the Handouts tab on your screen. And we hope you've printed that out and have it handy as it's going to be used for an interactive exercise in the course of the webinar. If you haven't printed it out, you'll find the Energy Wheel handout, again, attached to the webinar interface. Please print it out and keep it ready. Today's speaker is Andrea Sikon, MD, FACP. She's the chair of the Department of Internal Medicine and Geriatrics at Cleveland Clinic. Dr. Sikon has her graduate certificate in executive and professional coaching and has been the director of Cleveland Clinic's Center for Excellence in Coaching and Mentoring since its inception in 2008. With over 300 physicians and PhD participants, the center's mission is to facilitate a relationship-centered developmental network for all faculty across the career continuum with growing outcomes supporting increased participant resilience and engagement. Clinically, Dr. Sikon is also a national certified menopause practitioner practicing in both internal medicine and the Center for Specialized Women's Health at Cleveland Clinic. Her clinical interests include women's health, osteoporosis, menopause, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease management. Ladies and gentlemen, Andrea Sikon. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm very excited to uh, spend this time talking with you about two concepts that I think, for me, have been really transformational and for us in medicine. Um, right now, or, or recently, we've been facing an all-time high in burnout amongst physicians across the country. And um, these are two concepts that have um, unlocked, uh, unlocked ideas for how to break through and not only minimize burnout, but really maximize what we're able to accomplish. So moving on, just to give you a, a brief overview of how we're going to spend um, this next hour, I want to start by defining resilience. What do we mean by this? And what makes this such an important characteristic? And then next, explore how resilience ties into the concept of energy and how the two are interrelated. And you're going to have a chance, as Bill said, to reflect on your own energy assessment uh, halfway through. And finally, I'll share some coaching techniques that will help you formulate a plan to maximizing your energy to support work-life integration. So let's get started. And first, I'd like to talk about what it is that we mean by the term resilience. So I'm going to invite up a, a poll um, to get your, your input. Please select one. The first is the ability to stay rigid to your goals without wavering. Or is resilience the ability to accept reality, innovate, and bounce forward? Or is it a fixed characteristic, one you either have or you don't? So please take a moment to enter what your thoughts are. And I think we'll see the results soon. Looks like the vast majority uh, were correct, that the, it's the ability to really look around and see and accept reality. What are the circumstances we're in? And then to translate that into 
moving forward. And it's not only bouncing back, but really bouncing forward. Sheryl Sandberg, who wrote an incredible book, Option B, after the, uh, she's COO of Facebook and after the death of her husband, really put together, uh, a, and it's one of the references that I would recommend reading, talking all about the impact of resilience and what it is. So and resilience not only affords us to move forward closer to our goal, but it allows us to be curious and take perspective outside of our own in the moment and to be open. And we're going to be talking about ways and methods to accomplish this. And the other piece is that it's really a constellation of behaviors, thoughts, and actions that can be learned. We're not just born with it or not. We're actually, this is something that can be learned and, and nurtured over time. And to bottom line it, it's really about adaptability. How adaptable are we? So how is resilience important? Well, there's lots of evidence out there that people who are more resilient are actually healthier, they're happier, they actually live longer, and they're more successful. And I am sure that all of you have high levels of resilience. We've seen this in people who are the most successful. And when we actually look at the literature on the experts that study experts and what distinguishes them, we find that resilience is a key characteristic. And it actually makes us better employees. So this is something that if you're interested, not only from your own perspective, but how do you foster this in those who work for you so that you can help them to be more successful and achieve all these, these things. So with that, uh, I thought it was really interesting to go to. I, I'm very familiar with the physician literature. And really, this gave me an opportunity to look at the literature among business leaders. And the CO Genome Project is a study um, that looked at, it occurred over 10 years, and it looked at over 17,000 assessments of C-suite executives that included 2,000 CEOs. And its main goals were to identify the specific attributes that differentiate high-performing CEOs from those who are less successful. And what was fascinating is that they found four major distinguishers. And one, most of those CEOs didn't have all four, but they could nurture and grow their abilities amongst those four. And one of those four was that adaptability. So it was resilience. And this is something that, again, it's important not only uh, to grow in ourselves and to make ourselves uh, be more productive and more successful, but how do we nurture this in our employees to be maximally engaged? Because we know resilience and the concept of energy, which I'll define in a, a moment, both are highly overlapping in concepts and both feed engagement. And we know engagement impacts and drives quality of work and experience. So these are really interrelated concepts that feed one another. So with that, to introduce the concept of energy, energy is a word that we're all in turn more familiar with, but Tony Schwartz really brought this word in uh, something he, he heads up called the Energy Project. And the reference is included here. It's a great read. And it postulates that energy is the currency that we should all be thinking of rather than time. And what I hear most commonly from those individuals that I coach as well as that I lead is that they don't have time for things. There's not enough hours in the day. And that is very limiting. And what we find is that, and, and the bad news of it, is that time is fixed and finite. There are only 24 hours in a day and seven days in a week. However, if we shift our focus to energy, energy, when we have more energy, we can accomplish more in a given amount of time. So energy actually equates to greater capacity. And in fact, energy is actually expandable. We can grow our, our, grow our energy in an intentional way. And energy is, in fact, contagious. It's the ripple in the pond effect. And this is also that you know, um, time flies when you're having fun. The concept and notion of that you can get more accomplished in a given amount of time if you have more energy. It's a more energizing activity. However, the caution is, is that energy must be restored. You can't just use up energy 
energy does beget energy. However, you have to spend some amount feeding energy, and energy can be organized into different domains, which we're going to explore now. So energy and resilience, when you look at, um, depending on different constructs, many, many of the constructs define it in or organize it, the, them both in four domains. And so those are fairly intuitive. The first is physical. And physical is the obvious thing. Do you, how much do you sleep? What's the quality of your sleep? Do you get seven to eight hours of sleep a night? Do you eat nutritious foods? Do you skip meals? Um, are, you, are you mindful of what you're putting into your body nutritionally? Do you exercise? How much do you exercise? And the notion that many people don't think about is rest and recovery. Do we take time to just be? Do we take time to recharge? Or are we always working? Think about your last vacation. Were you checking emails all day? Were you still taking conference calls? Or were you truly unplugged? Think about, uh, I was talking about this earlier, uh, trying to turn off my Outlook messaging on my email so it wouldn't pop up. Do you, do you get distracted or do you take time to actually pause? And that's a key um, resilience building strategy, if you will, that builds your energy in the physical domain. The second domain is the emotional. So what is your mood? Do you spend time in maximally satisfying activities? And um, Tate Shanafelt, who's a physician who um, just left Mayo Clinic to go to Stanford, is an expert in the field of burnout. And he studies physician burnout. And he found that you only need to spend 20% of your time in maximally satisfying activities in order to protect against burnout. So that's pretty striking. That is not even the majority of the amount of your time, but just a fraction, less than a quarter of our time, in things that we really love will feed our energy tremendously. The next is relationships. Do we spend time fostering relationships? Relationships not only at home, but at work. Do we invest in those? Those actually pay off, and the time spent in those in those investments actually can help feed our energy and resilience and our ability to not only weather the storm, but to bounce back and bounce forward. Appreciation. This is a really fascinating concept that um, many of you may have heard of lately as this becomes more popular and out there in the mainstream media. When you express an, or appreciation, appreciation for life circumstance, appreciation to others, you and, and um, you may have heard of this in the notion of keeping a gratitude journal. People, there's lots of data out there that people are healthier, they have lower rates of depression, they have elevated mood, and um, they're actually more successful. So that is something concrete about how often do you just say thank you to somebody? How often do you even personally reflect at the end of each day if you just record three things that you appreciated throughout the day? And they don't have to be huge things that actually um, can have significant impact. The next domain is the mental. So this is another area that I think is really uh, particularly fascinating to me. How much do you focus at work, or are you a multitasker? And I will tell you that this area um, was really shocking, and I have to say that um, I've seen studies, gender-based studies of men versus women, and they've actually give, given male children and female children a, a, a task list to complete, and the males completed sequentially, and the females were more multitaskers, and I was always um, barking at my husband to be a multitasker, and in fact, he was actually right um, without knowing it, so actually multitasking makes you less efficient. And, in, and, and even in mundane or things that are simplistic. So when I'm um, in the middle of checking my email and my assistant walks in and asks me a question, even that simplistic, even if it's something that is an easy answer and doesn't take much thought, actually reduces your efficiency 
significantly. And in fact, some studies have cited up to 40% less efficient or, or it takes 40% more time per a single task. And if you think about that and how many things we actually do, our minds aren't actually set up to be able to multitask, especially if there's um, competition in the parts of our brain that are activated. So if you have background music, um, having background music that has words in it actually is very detracting and takes more um, extraction of energy or expenditure of energy of our brains to suppress that and work on what we're working on. So these are little nuanced things that are really fascinating and um, can accumulate over the course of a day to actually feed our energy versus detract from it. Taking time to for self-awareness, being open to feedback, taking time for self-reflection and goal setting. This is where working with a, a professional coach or one another as peer coaches and peer mentors, and I know this is something that you all engage in on a regular basis. The, that in and of itself, that act actually can increase our energy. And it is something that when you get busy, oftentimes we don't take separate time to do. The next is attitude. So having a can-do attitude, and it's and it's more than just being optimistic. Again, it's being what I like to say an optimistic realist. So thinking about what goals you do want to achieve rather than just having a problem-focused or a reactive-focused framework, having what we call an asset-based focus, which is to start first about, okay, what it is that I or we as an organization want to achieve? Next, reflecting on what your strengths are that you can access to achieve that goal, and then getting around to the barriers rather than starting with the barriers that are in your way first. This also extends itself to meeting. So how do you run a meeting when you're problem solving? Um, when you look at results, do you take time to celebrate the um, successes that you had and finding successes even in the failures that you have? Or, or do you get straight to the problems and just focus on the problems, which is human nature to do? How organized are you and your, your um, colleagues. And the organization, the more organized you are, the less rework you'll have to do. And I'm going to use that as an example going forward um, at the end to, um, to give you some specifics around how you might think about moving forward on a goal around that. And adaptability. We heard about this, and this is directly the meaning of resilience, is how adaptable are you? And then the last domain, which is the spiritual. And this does this includes but is not limited to religion. This is what are your passions and are you engaging activities that allow you to pursue your passions? Are you connected to your values? Do you reflect on your values and living with integrity, which is being true to your values? Do you feel like you're being valued and contributing? Do you feel like you're contributing to a greater purpose? Do you feel like you are accomplishing what your life's mission is? And what was interesting is um, we had invited Tony Schwartz to present at our organization a number of years ago. And we were in a room about 400 uh, leaders at the organization. And we took the survey together in a big room. And we each saw each other's results. And um, not surprising, we scored almost universally very low in the physical domain. And so people um, in our organization, healthcare organization, very aligned with their passion, sense of purpose, um, very feeling that um, they, they relationships were really important, impacting people's lives, but not taking care of ourselves, so not um, living what we preach right to everybody else, and certainly not taking the rest and recovery, and actually finding that we'd be more productive if we took some of that time that we felt like we didn't have, shifting that currency to thinking about energy, it actually makes sense to invest in a little bit of rest and recovery. And it doesn't take a long time. It can actually be um, less than a minute to just take some periods of mental breaks to make you more efficient. So I'm going to invite a um, poll question up. Just um, thinking about these four domains, out of the four domains, 
which one do you want to further develop? The physical, the emotional, the mental, the spiritual, or none? You've already, already got all this aced. You got it all down. So if we could see our poll results. Let's see, so it's, it's split. Um, there's a couple of individuals that maybe have it all done and we would they likely be great mentors for us um, to learn what they're doing. I think that um, it's, it's very common to see a split and, and this is just meant to, um, it's highly individualistic. So, um, so moving on, I'd like you to think a little bit more about reflecting about how you recognize resilience in yourself and energy. And um, thinking about specific activities that you do in each of these areas or don't do. And um, we're gonna move on to that self-assessment piece. So if you've pre-printed the energy wheel, if you can grab it, if you haven't printed it, um, it is available in the handout via the PDF. <clears throat> and what this, uh, wheel is is just divided into those four domains and the areas of what we had just talked about and this provides you just a visual self-assessment I'm going to walk you through it I'm going to show you an example of it of, of my own and then I'm going to ask that you complete your own and so basically what we want to do is rate ourselves on a scale of 0 to 10 0 being say non-existent within a given specific subdomain and rating ourselves at a 10 if we're at goal doesn't mean perfect just means at a a fully energized in a specific subdomain so you can take a few minutes to do this I'll show you mine and this is what it would look like so you're just going to draw a line across so sleep is something that I personally prioritize and um, <clears throat> being on call sometimes that's why it's not on a 10 um, but it is something that i really try to get seven to eight hours of sleep a night so i rated myself at an eight looking at nutrition i i try to do a great job and to cook but i have to say that um, i don't always reach for the best thing so i gave myself a seven exercise is almost non-existent unfortunately although i have to say that i've um, um been making some strides on, on this, and then the rest to fill in accordingly. So I'm going to give you a couple of minutes to complete your own self-assessment on your own energy and resilience in these four domains. And I'll ask that you now go ahead, reflect on the areas. We're going to time you. And think about what context. Some people think about some of the domains at work versus home. You decide which one you'd like to use. Some of this stuff changes as well over time, and uh, even sometimes day to day or week to week. So use whichever context seems right to you. Think about it from your own perspective, not from what you think other people would say, but from your own. And be honest, you don't have to share this with anyone unless you want to. Give you a little bit more time to complete it.
Hopefully all of you have completed it or near completing it. And if not, you can keep working in it. I am interested in reflections from it. Since it's a wheel, we tend to like to say how smooth was your ride, you know, when we're thinking about this in the context of work-life integration and thinking about how, how bumpy or balanced or imbalanced things may be. Perhaps we can see the poll, next poll question. Oh, I skipped this one. I apologize from earlier. So um, let's go ahead and, and do this. How often do you think prior to this exercise, you reflect on how you spend your energy? The first, I'm very thoughtful about how, when, and where I expend energy. The second, I think about it, but I'm not very deliberate about it. Or the third, I haven't purposely evaluated how I expend energy before just now. So a spread really across across the board. And most people it looks like thinking about it maybe, maybe once in a while or not at all, but not in a very deliberate way. So if we can see the next poll question actually. So reflecting on the exercise you just did, completing the wheel, who was surprised by your results? The first. I was. I thought I was more or less balanced than this. The second, some elements were surprising, but overall it was what you expected. And the third, nothing was really a surprise. I'm always interested to see what turns up in a group. So some surprises, some surprises um, for about half of you. And, and um, I know we don't have the opportunity to hear from all of you, but be thinking about um, if, if there were themes. And I think that some of the surprises I've heard when we do this in large groups is that sometimes, and, and very commonly, people anticipate that they were going to score really low. And some people, this actually the notion of doing a self this makes them anxious because they're like, oh, I don't want to really uh, put a number on how lousy I'm doing in, say, exercise like myself. Um, but what I found is really intriguing is that a lot of the time people actually score higher when they really think about it than what they, because we're hard on ourselves. And um, I think that with reflection, that is something that's been an interesting. Another interesting thing is, is if you take this wheel home with you and ask someone that's close with you to fill it out and um, that oh, about you and what they would think and how they view you and oftentimes we we view ourselves or rate ourselves much more um, rigorously than others rate us and sometimes it can be really really assuring because I think that for myself always worrying about how much time do I spend working um, you know impacting my family and that they actually rated me much, much higher in things than I rated myself. So also thinking about, um, as I mentioned earlier, the, the context in which you thought about this. Were you thinking about your relationships at work or at home or more globally? Um, were you thinking about different times in your life and how this would affect you, different resources that you have? If you have a physical something going on with you, if your health is diminished, that is something that, um, when you when you think about it, um, can really have an impact and in, in take from one area and, and force you to kind of um, drain your energy, if you will, as well as how one domain influences the other. And so this is something that sometimes if you increase your energy in one, you can actually remember energy is expandable and it's contagious. It actually influences and drives energy in another area. 
Okay. So we're going to move on to developing some strategies to enhance your resilience. And with that, <clears throat> I'm going to share with you some coaching tools. Um, in my work as a coach, this is something that um, it's very it's very individualistic. And when I think in, in our program, we distinguish between mentorship and coaching. And I'll just say that coaching is really a highly personal um, relationship, meaning that the coach doesn't really offer advice. The coach is more there to help someone self-reflect and listen carefully and ask questions to help um, guide the individual that they're coaching through the thought process without being prescriptive or directive. Whereas a mentor is somebody that you go to and say, hey, you've achieved success. You work out every day. You know, how, how could I exercise every day? So um, just a discernment and distinction there um, in, in our programming. So I'm sure many of you have heard of SMART goals before. It's just a construct, a, a mnemonic to help you kind of think about when you are goal setting, what are some key, it's a framework for, for thinking about it and building out your goals to help you be more successful. So with that, um, I'm going to give you my example. And as a preparation, it's just some tips um, for coaching yourself and one another on developing your own personal goals to increase your energy and resilience. So I actually chose organization for myself. And the reason why I did that is I was actually quite low on exercise. And I had been low on exercise for a while. And I've been trying to move that needle. And I found that I, I, was, I was really stuck. And so what I thought is that sometimes when you're so low in a given area or really stuck in a given area, actually working on another area that might feed the, the other makes that one that's more difficult easier over time. So I chose organization because that's something I used to uh, self-rate as very high. And I felt like that had um, slid down in, in where I had wanted it to be. And then it, I felt if I could be more organized, I could do less rework and actually gain more energy to exercise and to devote to that. So that's why I chose organization for myself. So <clears throat> let's go back to the, the um, mnemonic and start with the specific and measurable. And so one coaching tip I can give you is to at, establish your goal as a towards goal. So what do I mean by that? So oftentimes, we like to um, talk in terms of what we want to do less. So I want to be less scattered. I want to do less rework. That's, number one, not terribly motivating. And number two, it tells me what I want to get away from, but not what I want to move closer towards. And so framing it in towards language, if you will, and also I, you, you notice instead of saying I really need to be, I really need to do less rework, or I need to be more organized, I want to be more organized. This subtle language carries profound impact on ourselves and one another. So when you're either coaching yourself or coaching others, coaching your employees, um, the subtle language can have a huge impact. So my goal re reframed would be I want to be more organized. I want to be more efficient. Okay. The next tip is to be specific. So to Oftentimes, we talk in very vague terms. So um, being in medicine and being a teacher, we may give a, a trainee feedback to, uh, you should take a better history. And that's not terribly helpful for them to take action on, because it's not very specific. But if I said instead to them, you should listen to the patient and develop your differential, and then construct your differential based off of what you're hearing, that is much more specific for them to be able to take action around. So get specific with yourself. So what does organization mean to you? Um, it means being prepared for meetings in advance. What would you be doing if you were more organized? Um, I would know the information that I needed to prepare 
for that meeting, and I know exactly where it's located. What would others see? They'd see that I'm running on time. What would it feel like? It'd feel calmer. I'd feel more confident. I'd feel, I'd feel more respectful of others. I'd feel more in control. So the purpose of this is to really, we know in evidence that comes from how do we get people to achieve behavior change. And we know this in medicine from trying to counsel people to get them to stop smoking or to start exercising or lose weight, that you, ha you have to have high motivation in order to follow through with things. And you have to have a crystal clear view of how that would look and feel. So asking for feelings is really important, too, because it's going to get you more open and more inspired to following through on that goal. Now, if, that, if it were all that easy, we'd all be achieving all of our goals, right? Um, it's not that easy. And what makes us stay stuck is that we all carry around what we call automatic beliefs. We all carry around what informs our worldview. And these are many, many, and we all have them. And there's many different types of them. So automatic beliefs are what we have to overcome in order to make forward movement on our goals. So an, an example of that is an attitude. So I'm just not wired that way. I, I'll, I'll never be more organized. I'm just not wired that way. So questions, coaching questions to help us break through that stuckness is, OK, if, I can't even imagine. I can't even answer those questions about the, that we just talked about because I'm so stuck. What if things were magically how you want it? What if, what if you waved a magic wand and you went to bed and you woke up and you were magically organized? What would be happening? How would that feel? It helps us to kind of break through that and imagine. Absolute. So an, absolute, an example of an absolute is to be successful, I, I'd have to be completely organized at home and at work. OK, so that's a, a coaching question to address that is, that seems like a 10 to be organized at, at home and at work. So what's a five look like? You know, where are you now? Are, are, are you at a, you're, okay, I'm at a three. Okay, well, what does a four look like? So just getting people to kind of break it down and to make the goal smaller helps them to see it as more likely to be achievable. A distortion. So if I don't get more organized, I might lose all credibility. OK, that sounds like a worst case scenario. What's, what's more likely to be true, or what's the best case scenario? So those are coaching questions to help address those automatic beliefs and break through them. And then establish measures of success. So we've all heard that you, know, you, can't, you can't achieve these unless you, you know what it's going to look like. So how are you going to know you've made progress? What will others see? So. Um, in this example, I'll have what I need for the meetings. I'll feel more prepared. I'll, I'll, I'll be calmer. Um, I'll be running on time. So that gives you some examples of how to walk through the specific and measurable steps of the SMART goals. The next, you'll notice that I took out of order. It's not the A, it's the R. It's the relevance. This gets back to what I was talking about before, the motivation piece. If you have a stated goal, that you're not really truly motivated to achieve it. We see this with wanting to stop smoking all the time. I know I should stop smoking. I know I really need to. But you're not really motivated to do it. You're not likely going to follow through. You follow through on goals when your motivation exceeds your current, your, exceeds your current state, right? And so these are questions to help you explore how is this goal important to you? What do you hope to get out of achieving this? What would achieving like it feel? And what would achieving your goal allow you to do? And what's the potential downsides of not achieving your goal? And I think that this is something that we don't spend a lot of time. We spend time saying, what is our goal? And how are we going to get there? So motivations in this example. I, going to increase my energy and my sense of peace so that when I come home, I'm actually going to have more energy not only to exercise, but for my family. I'm going to be more patient with my family, with my kids and my husband. And the next critical, critical piece is what anchors us. It's our values. So also what anchors us to our behaviors is 
are those behaviors what is most important to us, which is our values? So how does this goal support what's most important to you? And what are you willing to give up to achieve your goal? And how does that fit into your values or not? Because one of the biggest um, detractors of our energy is when we're living in disconcordance with our values. So in my example, to, to be an example to my girls is really important. And to, to be an example to say that I love my work and I love my family. It's not a but, it's an and. And that you can have both. And to show them how that's done is really core value to me. So moving on, one little bonus that's not in the mnemonic, but this is something that I find particularly helpful coaching others and coaching, especially as um, in your positions in leadership. When you have somebody who may be acting in ways that seem unprofessional or discongruent with their values, getting them to reflect on their values, and then getting holding up the, the either concordance or disconcordance of how, how are you acting and how do you think how do you think that either supports your values or goes against your values? And that's a really way to help people connect and be less defensive about receiving feedback that they may have to, uh, they may be behaving in a way that's not culturally fit um, with your organization and helping them to see um, a way to behavior change that fits both your organizations and their own values. And then the um, A part is the attainable. And this is in, in concordance with what we briefly talked about. Oftentimes we say, OK, my goal is to get to 10. And I'm at a 0, and I want to get there in one big foul swoop. And we know that it doesn't happen like that. Success happens in small bites. And when we move and succeed in a smaller goal, we actually build our confidence. And that allows us to move on and continued smaller goals actually lead to that bigger goal over time. So some coaching questions to support that is to break down that goal into something that's more achievable. What does just one step look like? Um, what have you done to get there now? How can you build on that? And who can help you? And then the last piece, the Tom bound. So I will tell you that accountability is a huge piece that people fall off on. So they can do all that other great stuff. But if they don't commit to it, and they don't stay accountable to achieving that goal, and those steps, they're not going to um, garner success. So not only making that goal smaller into smaller bite-sized steps, but saying, when will you start? What will you do today? And who can help you? Who can help you stay on course? And who's going to help to remind you um, when you get off course? And how can you plan? What's going to get in your way? And how can you plan for that in advance? So a homework assignment is to use those coaching tips that I just reviewed and to hopefully pair up, ideally, and just simply ask each other those coaching questions. And it's not a checklist. You don't have to ask them all. Um, but to move through them with a partner to help one another target one desired new behavior that you'd like to move and increase on your energy and resilience. And um, that is labeled as the goals worksheet PDF that is attached. Another homework assignment I would say is to think about an inventory. And you already started to do this, I'm sure, when you completed your energy wheels. What resilience and energy building activities you already do. And formulate an actually written list of those. And think about how you can do those things you're already doing just more frequently. And then the last piece is to consider integrating these two activities that we just walked through with your employees. And how are ways that you can help others to reflect on their own energy and their own resilience and to grow it. So let's see. Um, how, about, how about we skip um, the next poll question, Bill? Um, just in the interest of time, and I'd like to do the activity um, that we have. This is kind of a bonus. This is a specific um, item that you can do, activity that you can do personally and, and with groups. Um, it's in the realm of mindfulness. And um, this is another area that's gotten a lot of and really a lot of media lately and um, is 
something that you can do in a small bite in 30 seconds or even longer activities of reflection and meditation and uh, mindfulness exercises. So we're going to actually do a mindfulness exercise together. And I'm going to walk you through it. And hopefully, you're sitting in a quiet place, if possible. And I'm going to ask you to get as comfortable as you can. And if you're sitting, have both feet on the floor and your back against the chair. And I'm going to invite you to close your eyes if you're comfortable with that. I'm going to be asking you to picture a series of people. And one by one, in your mind, send them good wishes. And in order for this to really work the best, try your best to generate as clear of a mental image as possible. Really picture this person in front of you. So I'm going to have you start with yourself. And I'm going to have you repeat slowly. May you be happy. May you be safe and protected from harm. May you be healthy and strong. May you live with ease. Next, picture a benefactor, someone who has been very important in your life, someone who has helped you, a teacher, a mentor, a relative. And repeat slowly, may you be happy. May you be safe and protected from harm. May you be healthy and strong. May you live with ease. Next, I'm going to have you picture a close friend, someone very special to you. And repeat, may you be happy. May you be safe and protected from harm. May you be healthy and strong. May you live with ease. Next, picture a neutral person. Someone you might pass by on a daily basis but don't really know. You might not even know their name. And repeat, may you be happy. May you be safe and protected from harm. May you be healthy and strong. May you live with ease. Next, picture a difficult person. Someone who's really been hard to get along with. Somewhere who may evoke anger in you. And repeat, may you be happy. May you be safe and protected from harm. May you be healthy and strong. May you live with ease. Next, picture all beings. May you be happy. May you be safe and protected from harm. May you be healthy and strong. May you live with ease. I'll have you open your eyes. And I'd like to see this, how you experience that. Was the experience calming and peaceful? Did it create a surprising response in yourself that you hadn't anticipated? Something that you think you may try again? All of those things? Or two out there? Not really helpful. So 
so very, very commonly we, we get similar responses. It is something that I have to say even for myself uh, seems quite out there and fairly touchy-feely, if you will, um, at first. And this is only one type of meditation or mindfulness exercise. You can do things even if it's just um, being mindful and focused about taking a deep breath in and a deep breath out before you walk into a meeting. It could be about when you brush your teeth, focusing on the feeling of the toothpaste and the toothbrush in your mouth. So there's many different kinds of mindfulness and meditation, and there's lots and lots of data out there. And a great book called 10% Happier that I have in a reading list, I'll show you in a minute, um, by Dan Harris. It really talks about the value of um, mindfulness and meditation in our lives and how it can increase our resilience and our energy. So here's a reading list. There are certainly innumerable books out there. I'm sure that um, you all could add to this list. Um, these are ones that speak further about different elements about resilience and energy and some of the concepts we talked about. And um, I am most happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Andrea, thank you very much for all of your help with this. This is a tremendous presentation. And at this point, we're going to open it up for just a couple questions. We just have time for a couple. Uh, the first one is resilience and energy seem to come within an individual. How can I help my employees increase their own personal resilience and energy? Yeah, I think that that's a very common notion. And I will tell you that um, um, Tate Shanafelt, the burnout expert that I referred to earlier, had studied the connection in physicians between professionalism and well-being and um, what, what drives performance. And what was fascinating is that actually only 20% came from the individual and 80% actually came from the system and the structure. And so setting up practices that not only culturally endorse these concepts, um, but setting up practices that can uh, help to encourage individuals to do these can not only drive it from the individual, but as a system. So examples, um, we uh, here at our organization, they uh, put forth a well-being day. So it's not to say that a single day accomplishes well-being, but it is a symbol and symbolic of the meaning that they're putting on the prioritization of taking care of yourself. You can start a meeting or, um, or even within a meeting, do a quick one minute turn to the person next to you and tell them something you appreciate about them. So there are all kinds of things that we can do big and little at a systems level to help our employees think about this. And the first is just about talking about it and prioritizing it. Excellent. Uh, you mentioned in your presentation that it's important to do the planning exercises with a partner. Why is it important to do it with a partner, and can I just complete it as a self-directed worksheet? Yeah, that's something that um, comes up often. And really, it's important. Uh, that's what brings kind of the role of a coach. And so the role of a coach is twofold. It's to hear things, those automatic beliefs, to really be listening and to be challenging what they're hearing. So it's to hold up the mirror for somebody and to ask them questions um, around so that you can kind of break through what might be keeping you and holding you back. And, and that oftentimes doesn't come out when it's just in your head and you answering the questions. Also, saying things out loud actually promotes a space between your feelings and your thoughts and allows you to kind of take control of those. So oftentimes we feel that um, we're stuck because of circumstances outside of us. And really saying it out loud helps you to kind of check things and say, hmm, maybe there is, there are other things um, that I can do. So it's an accountability piece as well. Excellent. Uh, you know, one other question we have is, what is the role of a coach, and how is this different than being a mentor? 
So um, and it means different things to different people. And I know, you know, sports coaches are out there, and there's lots of performance coaches as well. Um, and what we mean, or what I mean by coaching is more of a developmental, um, somebody who's going to listen to you and not offer advice, but instead listen to you and ask questions to help you move closer to your goals. So similar questions to the ones we were talking about, rather than saying a mentor has achieved expertise in a given area and would be more prescriptive with advice. So a mentor conversation would say, oh, this is what I've done to get more organized. You should have folders for you know each of your meetings. You should ask your assistant to do this. You should do this. Um, and sometimes, and that's very helpful. Both roles are very, very helpful. But oftentimes, people have a lot of mentors. And we all like to tell each other what to do and how to do it. And it may or may not help um, us in our particular situation. So having adding a coach to your developmental network can be a very powerful um, additional support role. Uh, Dr. Andrea Sikon, thank you so much for a very informative and a wonderful webinar. Uh, we really appreciate you joining us today. Thanks so much for the opportunity. I want to remind you that upcoming Fridays with Vistage webinars including uh, include Friday, July 21st at 10 a.m. Pacific. Happiness is not the key to employee productivity. Join Nikki Llewellyn of Rainmakers and Head of Partnerships at Amplify to understand why creating a culture centered on meaning is the key to increased engagement and productivity for lasting business impact. And on Friday, July 28th at 10 a.m. Pacific, the new multi-generational workforce. Workplace dynamics are different today than they were 10 years ago. The diverse mix of perspectives creates challenges, but the benefits can be enormous. It should be very interesting webinars. Again, this is Bill Black, your moderator, thanking you for joining us on behalf of Vistage Worldwide. We wish you continued success.